Morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Seafood from Scotland's Fish Mongers Masterclass with a fantastic week last weekend with CJ, CJ Jackson. CJ did a blinding display, um, especially uh, on the hake, which is something I'll always try to emulate in my own kitchen. My name's Roy Britt from Ondine and New Haven Fish Market. So this week, uh, CJ is going to be tackling shellfish. Um, she's got some real treats in store, and if it's anything like last week's CJ, um, I think everybody's going to love it. Anyway, welcome CJ, how are you? CJ, I can't hear you. Sorry right, can you hear me now? Yeah, I do. For everybody, just to, to bear in mind, this is a Zoom call, so uh, sometimes you can't, uh, well, things happen, you know. Zoom is the new thing, so uh, if things go off and on, just let us know and we'll try to correct it. Thank you, because uh, I've only got one. Um, somebody, I think Graham, has got his Seafood Scotland uh, apron on, so if he's going to be following this, I'm just, something's just flashed up here. Anyway, very nice to be here again. Uh, from rural Kent. Uh, I really enjoyed last week. It's a real uh, honour uh, to be uh, working with Scottish product and promoting Scottish product. Uh, most of my family live up in, uh, on the Murray Firth actually, and, and uh, around by Cromarty. Uh, and uh, it's a very special place for me, but I'm based in London at Billingsgate most of the time. Uh, so, uh, Roy, how's your week been? Have you been cooking much shellfish? Yeah, well, we started doing, you know, like, you know, we, we started doing the uh, Ondine at home on the Friday and Saturdays, uh, selling about 110, 120 lobsters at the weekend. Right. So between 50 and 20 fruits of the sea. Uh, I'll actually have to run downstairs when my shellfish arrives. It's going to arrive at some point. Um, I'm not too sure, sure when, but uh, I'll let you know. But it's, yeah, we're just, just like everybody, we're all just trying to... Uh, make a living out of this time and uh, there's lots of chefs in the same position that are coming online now and uh, you know and all the the lecturers all all at bay and you know they're really wanting to get back and give education to our, our, our future chefs so it's just a it's a funny old time but yeah it's been a busy old week it's been good I'm on my own <laughs> all quiet well I must say uh, for my lockdown I think this has been a highlight actually being able to communicate some of this product Anyway, uh, so today um, we're cracking on with shellfish. I've got a fabulous display. I've been up since four this morning up at Billingsgate. I spent a couple of hours up there uh, gathering all my bits and pieces together. Um, I turn up there at five and they all look at their watches and say, uh, slept in CJ because most of them get in at two. Um, but I've got uh, some really nice uh, products to, to talk about. Um, and on my display today, um, number one um, are our crustacea. Now, part of this session, I'm going to just dismantle the crab and look at dressing it. Uh, but crustacea, obviously, for shellfish, are going to be um, your lobster, uh, your Dublin Bay prawns or, lo or langoustine. Uh, I'm just going to move that across just to show, show these. Um, I've also got a crab. I'll bring that out in a minute. Uh, for storage, uh, they've been packed on ice to keep them nice and cool. Um, and then just a damp cloth over the top. Uh, looking at the rest of my selection here, um, so we talked about crustacea, anything with a, a joint or a hinge or pincers or feelers. Uh, you then have your mollusk group of shellfish. Uh, number one, one of my favourites, which are whelks or bucky, I think uh, you might call them up in Scotland. Um, these, for me, for many years, I thought you'd boil them and just pull them out of the shell with a fork, dip them in vinegar and be part of the shellfish platter. But actually at Billingsgate, they're really popular in the Korean market. Uh, I worked with a company, one of the shellfish companies one year, uh, and these girls used to come in every month and buy 10 kilos of these, uh, take them home and cook them with pork belly. So really, really popular. Also really popular in Italian cuisine. They make ragu out of these uh, with pancetta, tomatoes and, and wine. So I tried it, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, so those are gastropods or univalves, they're a sea snail, they're in a single shell. So those would basically be uh, category number one. Category number two then are the bivalves of, um, of the uh, mollusk group, a bivalves um, or the filter feeders. 
They include scallops. Um, I've opened up one. These were diver scallops. It can be diver, they can be dredged. Um, they, uh, there is a, a cost implication in that. Um, there's not concerns about the quantity of species or availability of this product, uh, but I think sometimes um, dredging can be more high impact than, than divers, but there's, uh, there's, twos and, you know, there's pros and cons for both. Absolutely stunning at the moment. Beautiful, deep orange coral. Uh, nice and large. Um, I know a lot of chefs sometimes don't like to work with that. So we take these out sometimes and dry them. I've got a dehydrator at home um, and I would dry them um, for a few hours until they're completely uh, sort of, well, shriveled and then powder them down. Uh, Roy, do you do that in your restaurant? Yeah, we make the coral, the coral butter. Um, okay. And uh, so you dry them first or do you just whiz them as they are? No, we dry them out first. Right. The, um, the good thing is that this week, David Lowry up, up here, he's managed to get us some uh, cracking scallops. He got us some at the weekend and coming through again. Um, and a guy grieves up at Ethical Shellfish. I think he's going to start, Juliet, his wife, contacted us saying that they're going to be delivering from next week as well. So it's quite nice to see that the, the guys are getting a chance to go out diving again and yeah. uh, getting the product into, into the restaurant. Excellent. Uh, well, these are, are, are really fabulous. I've, I've opened up one uh, just to look at what's inside. Um, I've been down at Mark Hicks. Uh, he sometimes takes the frill from around the edge from a diver scallop, uh, and then um, he would pan fry those. So I don't, a bit like, it tastes a little bit like bacon. Have you tried those? Yeah, I have. I, uh, do you know, we, we actually used to, we used to make a sauce from them. And we used to use, use the frills and we used, and I know in Japanese cooking as well, they cook them out uh, for a long period of time and they eat them as well. So it's, uh, I actually seen somebody here, it's Carla, um, and she dries them out and makes tweels out of them as well up in Sunny Mill. So, Tweel, uh, lovely, lovely. Sounds, sounds I'm going to move those on. Um, next thing then are the oysters. Uh, now, these are not from Scotland, um, and I know that you have your oyster bar, and I'd be really interested to know uh, where you source yours from. Uh, for me, I think these look to me actually like they are um, uh, from Carlingford Bay, uh, just the shape of them. Um, obviously, you know, they're uh, hugely affected by the nutrients they eat, so they're a filter feeder, they pump in the nutrients, feed off those, pump, pump it out, has a, a, an effect on the colour of the shell and obviously the flavour of the oyster. Um, what's your particular favourite with you? What, do, what are you selling? Well, you know, I, I was championing Barrow Oysters uh, when they first came out on the market. I still do, actually. Um, obviously not had any at the moment. Um, Carlingford Oysters, uh, County Lau, are one of my favourites. We, we usually hold between three and five different oysters. Uh, so we use Wright Brothers down in Borough Market for broken. Yeah. We buy from Welsh fishmongers. Uh, the interesting about Loch Fine as well, because when they um, depurate the depurate the oysters up there, they um, they can have oysters from all over Argyll. So it's interesting on the code boxes um, where they're marked as numbers. It, it actually defines where they're from. So although it says Loch okay. Fine, it's from all different parts because not everybody can afford to depurate their oysters. Uh, well, we get ours, uh, we do get some from Lock Fine, um, and obviously the flavour profile of these, uh, I, I particularly like Carlingford Bay, for me they're quite sweet, but I'll be looking out for Lock Fine uh, very shortly. I might look at shucking one of those um, in a little while, I'm going to move those away. Um, and then, I've obviously got my mussels, these would have come uh, from um, uh, probably Shetland, obviously uh, picking those over, anything that is open or damaged would be discarded. These are MSC certified, uh, these particular mm. ones. Uh, I must say, uh, for me, they're probably the most, uh, most uh, sustainable seafood you're probably gonna eat. Um, you know, they're attached to a, a rope. Uh, they grow in the nutrients in the water, which feeds the, the muscle. Uh, there's no interaction with a farm and they're not being fed, they're living on the nutrients. And then they just take them out, uh, depurate them uh, and then process them. So um, I do a lot of work with environmental health officers looking at, uh, quality of water and some of the best quality waters in Scotland. So uh, always a really good option. Um, okay, and then finally, the third group then um, are the cephalopods or cephalopods. Um, now I was up in Peterhead with Jess Sparks, who is 
uh, one of my gurus. Um, and uh, when we were looking at boxes of these, they had them, the, some of the best quality um, squid I've ever seen from uh, the Murray Firth. Uh, and uh, they were so white, they were almost blue and translucent. Um, I think uh, I like at Billingsgate to use cuttlefish, uh, but squid is probably one of the most popular um, seafood. I think it's landed in Scotland. Uh, and I think it's probably one of the most consumed seafood globally because I believe every ocean and, and sea has a species of squid. So every culture seems to be uh, working with them. I prepare them as usual. I've sliced some for pan frying, stuffed them, braised them, uh, scored them. Uh, what do you do with them, Roy? Yeah, we, we use, well, we, we score them as well. I remember when I used to work with Hixie down at Caprice and we used to do it with uh, like a scored and um, just marinated in olive oil and thyme. And uh, we used to do it with sal salsa and pancetta bacon and rocket. But that was a way back in the 90s when rocket was a new thing. Uh, but up in Ondine, we, we've had it on for 11 years. We do a tempura squid and we serve it with a Vietnamese uh, dipping sauce. It's just interesting. Um, I was just seeing that Jess Sparks has came back and said 70% of all mussels are landed up in the Shetlands. So yeah. uh, for consumers, so that's quite an interesting fact. I didn't know that. And uh, I was wondering if Jeff Dalgleish could answer a question, uh, not Jeff, um, Kevin Dalgleish could answer a question about somebody's looking for oysters up in Aberdeen and where they get them from. So I don't know, Kevin, if you're getting the oysters just now and who can, who's supplying up there? Did you get a response? Not yet. Okay. Uh, well, uh, tempura squid may well be on lunch, my lunch menu today. Uh, that's the one advantage of uh, being able to prepare it all here. It's here. So, okay. Oh, Graham Mitchell to all answered. So thank you for that. Um, okay. So um, I just wanted to go back to this beautiful lobster. Um, identified uh, just purely by the colour of the shell and the, and the white freckling. Uh, and one of the key things for me today was I did specifically ask the supplier at Billingsgate to give me a male. Um, and that this is a female. You can tell this by the shape of the tail. If I turn that round, uh, the tail is slightly splayed. So she's not carrying any eggs and berries in there. Um, if she was, uh, that wouldn't be uh, acceptable at Billingsgate. Um, unless it's from Scotland, I believe uh, that's still acceptable. But um, she is about 750 grams. So uh, to my calculations would be between 12 and 14 years old. It takes about 500 grams uh, to grow for the seven to eight years. Uh, for me, this is probably one of the largest I'd go for. Uh, what do you feel, Roy? How, what, would you, what would you, well, I think we talked about this and you said you prefer to buy males so that you don't have any issues with the eggs, but what sort of size, uh, would you work with something this large? Yeah, just I think that's about as big as we would go. We, we would use that for like our fruits of the sea. For like a grilled lobster that we're preparing just now for Ondine at home, we'll, we'll use between five and seven hundreds. Right. Um, it, the other thing is as well, like um, Andy Cummins made a good point there, just saying the big ones are, are too tough. And I get that, you know. I remember one time working down at the Seafood in Padstow and we, we got like a two kilo lobster and it was... You know, we, we sold it. I felt sorry that we were killing the bloody thing. And then we sold it and the, the guest wasn't that happy with it. Just like what Andy said. He said it was, it was oh. a very enjoyable. Well, the, the other thing, of course, as they get bigger, the, uh, the, there's more shell, there's thicker shell. So you're paying more for the shell than you are for the meat. And if you overcook it, uh, you've had it. So when I'm buying them, I generally, I like to buy between um, six and 700 grams maximum, really. Um, they're top of the form at the moment. The price is really good at Billingsgate. Um, and normally, uh, down in London, we would be looking at uh, both the, the Scottish uh, or native lobster versus the Canadian lobster. But no one's bothering the Canadians at the moment. Uh, the quality is not great at this time of the year for the Canadians, but they're also, they normally bring them into, you know, as a price comparison. Uh, so you can buy them cooked, frozen, live, um, and they're just not bothering with them. So this says a lot about the quality of these right at the moment. And I think certainly the sweetest one around. So, I'm, um, I'm I'm just quite just sure say, what I, sorry, what were you going to say, Roy? I was just going to say, like, um, I know there's a, a big uh, lobster company down in London, not company, but a restaurant that sells a lot of lobsters and meat as well. And at, at, at Heathrow, they've just got tanks and tanks and tanks of 
Canadian lobsters. And I just wonder what happened with all them when COVID happened and restaurants closed. Because well, I wonder whether they just boiled them and froze them, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, with one of the legal requirements of the Canadian lobsters is they can't, uh, they, they can't keep them closer. Uh, I think it's a mile from the sea. They legally have to keep them further than that. Uh, so there's no possibility of them escaping into, into our waters. Um, okay, uh, I bought this, um, a live crab. Um, I did ask again for a hen and a cock crab, but was given two cock crabs, so I don't know what was going on. Somebody was asleep this morning. Um, we were looking at this, and when I'm buying this, I would be looking for something quite lively, which is what we have here. Uh, before I handled it, I would just double check that the claws have been clipped. Um, they normally cut them through here, so that there's no possibility of pinching or being caught with that. I was telling Roy the story recently of a, a chap that I work with, and his first day at work, um, he got one of these attached to that part of his thumb, I'll show you there, um, and it dug in. It's not like a little pinch, it's more like a Tudor thumb wrench where they just tighten it and tighten it. Uh, and the chap who he was working for said, uh, if you break that claw off, you're out of work. So he hung around with this hanging closely. Yes, ouch, David, it was a big ouch. <laughs> um, and uh, hanging onto his hand for about three hours, and he had the biggest bruise, uh, but he was determined to keep the job. So, so they're not, they've got a lot of power in those claws. Um, this is a cock crab, you can tell uh, just by the apron here. Um, the cock crab would be more popular uh, in Northern European cuisine, I would say. Uh, you've got nice claws, but you've got lots of white meat. And in the purse underneath the back here, you're also gonna have a lot of white meat. Um, there is a good market at Billingsgate for female hen crabs. They have a much larger apron. Um, they have smaller claws, but in their carapace at the back here, uh, they also have um, a really nice sweet meat, uh, which is very popular. Now, there's a question here because um, one of the issues we've had recently is the amount of cadmium, which is a, a heavy metal, uh, which is found in crab meat. Uh, and that's sort of been has cropped up a little bit with the, uh, the Chinese market. The Chinese market have been buying these left, right and centre and they've held back a little bit because they're concerned about the cadmium. Um, I don't think we eat enough of it. Generally, with any heavy metal, I don't think we eat enough uh, fish and, and seafood uh, globally in order for it to make an, uh, have an effect on us. Um, but uh, I think uh, they probably recommend that we don't eat too much brown meat um, over a period of a month. Uh, the other thing I was going to say was how to dispatch these. Now, um, normally uh, I would, if I'm at Billingsgate, uh, would either really cool these right down in, on ice to slow the metabolic rate right down, uh, and then you then have to kill it. Uh, and Roy, again, we had a, a conversation yesterday about this. So what's your preferred method to dispatch this? Well, I, I like to turn it, turn it over so it's on the, shell, the top shell side. And yeah. Then, I put the knife through the head. Through here? Right through there. And then yeah. I, I will put, pull the tail back. Yeah. And I dislocate the legs and just cut straight through. Okay. He's not going to let me have a look at that. He's alive. And then what <laughs> I we... Think, uh, just, just in there. Uh, well, um, there's a lot of discussions about it. I know a lot of fishmongers uh, would put them into tepid tap water, uh, which basically drowns them. Um, and there's a lot of discussions at the moment as to um, the most humane way of dealing with them. Uh, and the Shellfish Association of Great Britain would be really interested to hear from restaurants and chefs as to what the way that uh, they dispatch them. Um, they're working with uh, Crustacean Compassion uh, and the RSPCA to come up with an agreed way to do it and a paper on it, which looks at the way you handle these products, the humane way of dealing with them, whether they experience pain. And the Shellfish Association of Great Britain, I would really be interested in hearing from chefs. Um, you too, Roy, about the way that you feel is the, is the most effective way. Um, and then they're gonna put a paper together which would lay out what they consider to be the kindest, uh, kindest way to deal with it. It'd be quite interesting to know the, the practice, what the, the colleges use as well um, throughout the country and how they dispatch of lobsters and crabs, langoustines, my shellfish delivery is just arriving now, so I'm going to open the front door. Is that all right? Have you got to go and answer it? Oh, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, well, the stunning. Uh, there's, there's an opportunity to stun them. Bye, Roy. I'm just going to carry on talking. Uh, so what you would do with these uh, is you need to stun them. Um, and 
larger um, organizations do that it doesn't kill them it takes them to a comatose state you then actually kill them by putting them into water into boiling water ideally but as we all know you put that into boiling water you know it's in a distressed state if it's alive because all the limbs drop off and you get uh, uh, you sh they shoot their claws so uh, quite key for that I'm just going to go back to my lobster a moment and just look at the way that that is protected with um, the bands on the claws so they have big holding tanks at Billingsgate and they hold these um, they put a, a, elastic bands on the claws not only just for health and safety but because they can store these for a considerable amount of time um, they have to make sure that they don't uh, attack or have a, a bit of a punch up with the others in a in, in a tank they're very territorial um, and they are predatory so uh, by by banding the claws that's uh, the most effective way but um, I was working with a, a company recently who maintain that the bands should come off before you cook them uh, and apparently they think that the elastic bands um, has a, have a, a, an effect on the flavor of the water so uh, just a, a consideration there I don't know what people think about that but it was that was advice I was given recently you've got a nice big crusher claw and the little agile claw there as well so I'm going to put that aside um, and then I just want to do the final little conversation about the beautiful language or um, the Dublin Bay prawns. Now, you know, I'm really interested with these because uh, I was at a, doing a, a television project program recently and the researcher who does all the researching uh, and processing asked me to source British landed product and I was desperately keen to uh, promote these. And I said, oh, we'll have Dublin Bay prawns or langoustine. She went, no, well, they're not landed in the UK. Uh, and that's somebody who's in the food industry. And it just says a lot about people's understanding about these. They prawns, you speak to Jimmy Buchan. Um, he came down uh, and met, met up with us recently at Billingsgate. Uh, he was talking about his landed prawns off the Amity. Uh, he showed me his quick me method of cooking them. Um, but he um, you know, is it, promoting them. And, I was in Sicily last summer and uh, people were tucking into them. Uh, people love prawns here. Uh, the North Atlantic cold water prawn is a big thing. But you put this in front of somebody and they get all nervous about it. So, um, so you've got, I've just seen somebody adding notes to this. Um, mainly Scottish landed. There's a few landed into Cornwall, um, but mainly uh, they're either live, which tend to be the most expensive, uh, chilled or dipped, uh, where they dip them in, in a chemical to prevent uh, discoloration or they freeze them and these actually today were frozen I don't think many um, prawn boats are out at the moment uh, Jimmy's recommendation for cooking these now I normally just drop them into boiling water until they bob to the surface uh, but Jimmy's um, method of cooking is he sautés a mirepoix in a little bit of oil and then adds the uh, the raw langoustine oh I've got a lobster trying to escape here he just put it back in the box um, sorry uh, in there. And, yes Easy. Just, just, uh, just a little. Uh, somebody's giving me a little bit of feedback. Could you take the camera slightly further away from the board so we can see a little bit? Yeah. Is that okay. Is that better. Just a little bit more. Yeah. Is that that's better? Much, that's much better. Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. Sorry about that. So the, the lights are filming in the kitchen. So yeah. So he sautes them in a mirror <laughs> um, and then he uses that for a base. What are you giggling about? I'm just laughing. <laughs> Anyway, has your shellfish arrived? It just arrived now, and I told them to come at bloody nine o'clock. So, um, so sorry about the interruption. No, don't worry. Okay. Anyway, so um, those are very special. I absolutely love them, um, and I know I think the price for uh, for a, an average household might be a bit prohibitive, but it, it's just such a, a, a such a sadness that many of these get exported. Um, and I think uh, possibly exporting now is going to be a real issue. So we really must be focusing. We need the Sea for Chain campaign, with, uh, which is DEFRA, uh, and we need to be eating them much more. Um, and that size tail, um, you'd get probably in a kilo uh, about 10 of these. So really, uh, you know, 100 grams each is going to be really superb. I just okay. see uh, Jess has just sent there's 18,000 tonnes per year of langoustines exported that's incredible yes it's a, it's a, a pity uh because i think um you know we could be uh, we could be using them you know all that stock what do you use them for the langoustines we do them uh, we, well this week we're doing just the uh, langoustine mayonnaise just nice and simple 
Um, and also we've got them on the fruits of the sea. And we also do them sort of with a, like a, just a plain garlic butter. I think it's just CJ with my time with Hixie and uh, Rick and people like that. You know, they, they kept things nice and simple. And we were across in Singapore about four years ago and we, we were cooking for a, a group of Chinese chefs, you know, between one, two, three star Michelin. And uh, we just served fruits of the sea to them because how could I impress these guys? I wasn't trying to impress them. I just wanted them to taste Scotland's uh, seafood in its most natural form. And uh, they went down really well. I was over there with Claire um, from Seafood from Scotland. And, you know, they just wanted to taste Scotland's seafood as it's natural, in its most natural way. So uh, sometimes uh, simplicity wins. No, absolutely. And I think just, uh, I've just seen Valerie saying that she uh, puts hers into a, a risotto. Um, I love it with asparagus. You know, this time of the year, asparagus um, and uh, langoustine with lemon and risotto is superb. Okay, so uh, the next thing I was going to do, um, just having looked at those, there's so many other things on the market, but I just wanted to look at the main cate uh, the categories. Uh, the next thing we want to do then is looking at the breaking down of the crab, uh, ready for dressing. Now, I've slightly cheated. I've already dressed one. Um, and this is quite a big Scottish uh, crab. Uh, it's going to take quite a lot of effort to crack through those claws. Um, I've chosen specifically the male crab or the cock crab. We've got that apron. Um, and the preparation of this, obviously on a white board, uh, it's cooked, so it needs to be on, uh, so avoid cross-contamination. I would normally use gloves for this, uh, but um, I think just for ease for me today, um, if I was preparing it for somebody else, I'd use gloves. Uh, and I've just got all my bowls and bits and pieces for the rubbish. Uh, so, uh, just going through the preparation of this, um, we're going to be taking out the brown meat, uh, which is the carapace, that's the offal. Um, on a cock crab, I personally find it a bit musty. Uh, so I'm going to add a few seasoning or a little bit of seasoning to this um, before it goes back in the shell. Um, the claws are huge uh, and I'm going to just pull those claws off, just pulling them away um, from the main socket. Just going to make sure everybody can see that. Um, and then just pull the second one away. So claws come away and those are going to be set to one side, ready for cracking to remove. Um, the legs, now I like to use the legs for garnish. Uh, there's a little bit of white meat on those, so I'm going to just pull that off and set them aside. Um, I uh, think probably um, a lot of people might just crack them, or if you're being really fastidious, take the meat out. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, if I have people round, crack sorry, them and then uh, give them I a... Um, sorry, you're right. Yeah, sorry, it's just Jim's asking if you could just tilt the camera... Uh, the, the camera's still too low, if you could just bring it up a, bit. a bit. Yeah, it, and Better? Is that all right for you, Jim? Yes? Yep, he's yep. happy. Okay, he's Jim, Jim, thank you for that. So pull off these, off they come. Um, I'm going to use those as a bit of garnish later. Um, and then um, I'm just going to be looking at what we want to remove. So I'm going to take off the apron straight away, because if that shatters, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, and that's going to go in my rubbish bowl. Um, when I'm dressing this, I always use glass or metal uh, so that when I'm picking the meat up, particularly from the claws, you can shake the bowl. And if you've caught any uh, shell in there, uh, you'll be able to hear it pinging against the side of the bowl. So glass, metal normally in the school, uh, in Billingsgate, but um, I haven't got those today, I've got the glass. I then want to remove the purse. So thumbs underneath, um, line the carapace on its back, and then lever up just to push that straight out. Um, and as that comes out, I'm just going to tip that so you can actually see uh, it's got a really lovely amount of brown meat in there. I want to remove uh, those gills or dead man's fingers. Those are going to come off and go to my rubbish. Uh, lots of discussion about the gills. People often say to me, oh, well, I'd eat them. But crabs are very nomadic um, and you never quite know what quality the water uh, they're in. And that is going to hugely affect uh, the gills. Um, because they're going to be the main, the main contact with the water, I'd always get rid of them. So She's pulling those water. out, there are some on the uh, purse, uh, and there's also some still in the carapace, which I'm just going to just count them and, and just ease them out. Uh, next thing for me, I think I've pretty much got rid of those, I want to release the mouth and take the stomach sack with it. So to do that, I gently press down, 
which snaps, you get a snapping sound, snaps the, um, the mouth away from the main shell. And instead of just picking up and pulling out, you want to gently roll that across the body. I'm just gonna try and do this so you can actually see. By rolling it and pulling it out across the body, you will take the stomach and leave all the brown meat uh, inside. If you just put it up, you're more likely to take some of that brown meat out. So rolled across the body, and then that's gonna be discarded. So you've got your gills, you've got your stomach, you've got your mouthpiece, you've got your um, apron in the rubbish bowl. Um, and we now need to just have a little look, it's a tiny bit of that stomach left in there, to see what we have in, in the center. Now in here, you've got that little bit of membrane um, to pull out as well. And then we can just view the fabulous quality of the brown meat in there, which is all of the offal. Now I have a lot of people a spoon saying that they don't like or don't like the look of it, but actually I think it's, um, you know, it's look at the quality of that. It's absolutely full in the shell. So I need to turn it so you can see. Loads and loads of it coming out, scooping that away. Now they would have cooked this uh, and the key thing about cooking, um, there's obviously, unlike a lobster, there's very little colour change. It goes probably redder, a sort of a more of a, a brick red uh, when it goes into boiling water. So calculating the cooking time is really key. Um, generally, a lot of fishmongers would cook it in quite heavily salted water with the, the idea that the, um, it, it actually sort of extends the shelf life a little bit with having a bit more water in it. Um, and then once it's had its calculated cooking time, it needs to be cooled really rapidly. Uh, if you cool it too slowly, obviously there's a health and a hygiene um, aspect of that, but if you cool them too slowly, what happens is the meat is more likely to stick to the claws. If you cool it rapidly and you've cooked it properly, the meat um, should release easily from the claws and won't stick. So um, really important to get, to get that really cooked uh, and, and cooled off very quickly. I just had a brown meat in there. Sorry, carry on. Uh, we've had a question, how long do you cook your crab for? Well, I would say 15 minutes to 500 grams is about ideal. Um, this uh, would have been in, I reckon it's just under a kilo this, so I'd have probably cooked it about 20, 25 minutes. Um, you can do it in a cork wheel, and imagine at one point, they would have probably even cooked it in seawater, but obviously that's not gonna be an option now. Uh, we don't want anything like that. Um, but um, yeah, so that would be my, my ideal cooking time. Okay, most of that, it's one of the best crabs I've seen actually, it's absolutely full of brown meat. So um, I'm gonna deal with the carapace in one moment. What I now want to do is just look through the middle of this, just to scoop out, there's a little bit of brown meat. Now, interestingly with crab, um, it's got one of the highest levels of um, omega-3, in fact, I believe, and I think Jess might be able to uh, agree with this, that they had the highest level of um, omega-3 of all the shellfish. Uh, so a really good option. Um, oysters actually also have put, uh, got a good uh, omega-3 levels. So people are saying, oh, you've got to eat oily fish the whole time. By all means do, but there are shellfish options. So um, digging all that out, all that brown meat. Uh, and then I'm ready to just think about what I'm going to do with the carapace. There's going to be in the chambers here, uh, right through here, there will be um, lots of white meat. For me, um, they, uh, sorry, there's somebody asking, saying the purse contains a lot of water. Well, sometimes, it's a good question actually, the meat in here is really uh, nice and full, uh, but when it goes through um, a, a change, as in when it, it molts its shell, what happens is when they're ready to uh, grow out of their shell, this area along the edge here, which is a natural line, comes loose, uh, the crab ejects the top shell um, and then puffs in water and they're able to puff in about 20% of their body weight uh, in water. They puff that in, the new shell begins to form over the top, it becomes rubbery and then in quite a short period of time it becomes quite, uh, quite hard. Uh, they then release that water and it's at that stage that the, uh, the brown meat can be a little bit on the watery side. Um, when they have shot or lost their top shell and they become leathery, they would then be referred to as uh, a soft shell crab. And it's actually illegal in the UK uh, to, um, uh, to land or to harvest these if they're in a soft shell state. 
The soft shell crab that's so popular in the States is the blue crab, uh, which is caught around um, the sort of North Carolinas and popular uh, in, in June, July time um, in New York. Uh, it's a very popular seasonal thing. But these, um, you can't do that with them. Uh, the other thing I didn't point out uh, is that uh, it's actually also illegal to land these if they've got any eggs and berries. Now, I don't have the hen to show, uh, but under the, um, the apron of that, you can actually see the eggs because they're bright orange. Um, on a lobster, uh, they are black. So it's, it's, you need to actually look for those to identify them. But a crab, they're orange. And if you can see that, again, that would be um, an illegal landing. And finally, the other thing I was going to say about these was the uh, minimum landing size. Both lobsters and crabs and scallops, they have minimum landing. For a crab, it's measured across the, the widest part of the carapace, which is from here to here. Um, I think the smallest one allowed is actually the little chroma crab, uh, which is the same species, but it tends to be smaller. And I think the minimum landing size for that's about 100 millimeters. Um, it will depend where it's from um, to, uh, I don't know, I suspect uh, Claire could tell us uh, where you know, the sizing, or Jess as well, uh, for Scottish crab. Um, and uh, one of the last things I was going to say about this is that you know, we think about the sustainability of these, the way we harvest them, the size. But Roy, if I said to you, when do you think did we start really thinking about sustainability with seafood? Where, when, which decade did you think uh, you might have thought about it? That's, that, that's a good question. I, I, I'd probably say it was about 18 years ago. I think that's when we first started talking about MSC. Um, I remember down in Padstow, we were, you know, that's when we first started to do it. And Rick was doing events up at Fishmongers Hall and, you know, Prince Charles and all the, you know, the, the big people were uh, supporting it as well. So I, I think it was about then. And I think it's like sustainability and seasonality. It's, um, the words that you must follow through, you know, I think it, it's, it became quite a buzzword, you're seasonal, you're sustainable, but, yeah. you know, and the, the, that's the thing is that you've got to question yourself all the time, is it seasonal, is it sustainable, as much as shellfish, as much as vegetables, as much as everything, you know, so you, I think we've all got to do our, the best that we can. Well, interestingly, uh, when I was working on a, a book project, um, I was looking at methods of fishing, and one of the key uh, conversations was on beam trawling. Uh, and there was a book published in 1910, uh, sort of questioning uh, the damage it was doing, you know, how much was, was being allowed. But actually, um, I did a, another project um, going back to the 1880s. And back in the 1880s, they set, set then a minimum landing size for these. I think it was about four and a half inches. Um, but because people were helping themselves, they also in those days created an oyster ring. We've got Pacific or rock oysters today. Uh, those are in season. Um, what's not in season now, it's just about out, um, are the native oysters. Um, and during the 1880s, of the end of Victorian period, people were going and helping themselves because it was cheap food. So they created these oyster rings so you can actually see what size they were. So it's interesting that all this time, uh, now it's more important because there's more of us and there's more eating of it, but it's been going on for a long time. Anyway, so uh, somebody's just asking about velvet crabs. I'll tell you what we do have at Billingsgate from time to time are mitten crabs. Uh, and they look like a little velvet crab. Uh, you know, that velvet crab almost feels like very finely cut grass across the top. But the mitten crabs are right on the claws here. They have just that. They have a little velvet mitten wrapped around this part. It's really soft to the touch. Ridiculously expensive. They're an illegal landing in the UK, but I think they produce them uh, in Holland. Um, and the other one, um, of course, are spider crabs. We get those at times. Uh, and, uh, and then we get frozen, um, a lot of frozen uh, Alaskan king crab, and they're really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. These, for me, are some of the best. Uh, mud crabs, yes, we're just talking about mud crabs. We do get mud crabs on the market. Somebody just asked that. Um, and um, they're always very feisty, uh, and the merchants that sell them have a big bucket of them. And then when somebody asks for them, they hand the bucket over so people can then help themselves. I think they've all been nipped a bit, but it is possible to get them. They're very small. They're um, about sort of an eighth the size of this thing. Uh, and uh, what they would do with those is boil them and then suck the meat out of the claws. They use it a lot for chili crab. Um, Chinese market would, be, would love that. Right, okay, I was still gassing on. Um, so what I want to do next, uh, the brown meat uh, for me, I would season that. Now, seasoning is entirely up to you. If the meat um, is 
uh, would be um, a little bit runny, uh, a little bit on the soft side. Uh, what I would do is add some breadcrumbs to it, but I'd rather not. For me, I like to put a little bit of brown vinegar in there. I think for me, uh, the, uh, the male crab or the cock crab has got quite a musty flavour and it's, it's very, very rich. So a splash of vinegar in there. Um, and a uh, little bit of um, English or uh, mustard, um, Coleman's mustard or something like that, just to sort of lift the seasoning. Uh, what do you use, Roy? Yeah, we, out the head, mate, we, uh, on the, the fruits of the sea, we just try, when we're, we're cleaning them, preparing the crab, we, we try to keep all the, the brown meat intact in, in the head. And, uh, but if we're, make, if we're doing a dress crab, we'll take the brown meat and make mayonnaise. So we do like Right. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, good, great, great. Now, the next thing I want to do then is get this shell ready for preparation. The only thing uh, is that this uh, is full in the shell, which tells me that this is going to be quite challenging to crack open. But I'm going to protect my hand and I'm going to try and snap the shell back along the natural line there, uh, just holding that, either by pulling it or pressing it. No, it's too. There we are, gone. Uh, if you put enough pressure, it should snap along the actual line. So you're pretty Remember, brave. sorry? You're pretty brave doing that, everybody watching. <laughs> what, cracking it? Well, um, I have cracked and I have broken it a couple of times, but just gently pressing that down so it just breaks along the natural edge there. The same on the other side, either pull back. Now, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to crack it now. Okay, I'll just press down and pull that away. And then what I want to do with this is just wash the shell under cold water in order to get rid of us, uh, make sure we can get rid of a lot of that mud um, to, for the, the, uh, uh, the crab to go back into. A little bit more brown meat there, just on the edge. And then um, just a really good rinse just to get uh, that edge nice and clean. So uh, I'm then going to split my, uh, the main purse here because we'll have a look at the chambers. Uh, I'm going to use a big chopping knife, hold that in place and down. So by holding it so it's less likely to split and slip, we're then going to look for the meat. Now for years, I uh, must admit that I really didn't make a lot of effort uh, to take the meat out of these chambers. It's the sort of thing you want to do on a Saturday afternoon with a glass of wine when you're watching the football or something like that. Not that you'd be watching, wanting to do this watching the football, but it's the, uh, the idea of it. Um, and um, I spent half an hour doing it once and I was amazed at the amount of white meat you can actually get from the, uh, from the centre here. So um, I'm going to use um, a little seafood pick and just have a little look to see at these chambers. This is where you really do need um, your glass bowl because there's very, very fine um, little bits of uh, shell in there. Uh, I don't know if you can hear it, but that, that poor lobster's scuffling around in its box with lots of ice on it. So I'm going to decide what's going to happen to that later. So I'm going to just scoop all of that out. And it is tedious and it takes a long time to do it. But I would do it once from there. There's a little bit more brown meat in here. Just make sure everybody can see that. I'm going to snap off anything that's likely to break and remove. Um, and then uh, I will cut that in half again. TJ, there used to be a, a family called the Murch. They're still, obviously, still down there in Padstow. And they, they, they were crabbers, and, uh, and they still catch the crabs, but they, they, they used to take them out to the, on the pier front. And I always just remember the smell in the morning of the crabs boiling. And if you'd had a few the night before, it wasn't the best. <laughs> well, I, um, well, before I arrived at Billingsgate, um, they used to have a crab boiling shed and you'd see uh, the old fashioned porters sitting there with these metal awls uh, going, you know, sort of uh, dispatching them through the brain here. Yeah. Uh, and then they had this big boiling area. But of course, what they would do is they would put the, the, uh, the crab in and then disappear off for a smoke and a breakfast. So no one was really managing it. So it got closed down in the end. So the only way of actually getting hold of a cooked one uh, is pre-ordering it now. You, you either buy them live or cooked um, and uh, obviously a really popular product. 
Um, and certainly, if people are un unsure, certainly some of our general public um, who would be unsure about how to dispatch it and couldn't cope with that, I would uh, recommend they bought them actually cooked. But yeah. if you buy them cooked, it's always a good idea to lever out and ask to lever out the main purse. So you can just see how much, um, how much moisture is in there. So you've got an idea of, it wants to feel heavy for its weight. Um, and that watery part um, is really key. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna carry on uh, doing those. That'll be a job for later on this afternoon. But you need to carry on pulling that white meat out there. Um, I'm gonna now just have a look at cracking the claws, which is the most exciting part of the whole thing. So what I'm gonna do next, is just looking at my claws. I'm using a great big, this is, I used this last week when I was managing the cage. Um, and with this, you can absolutely annihilate it by just giving it one thwack. Um, I'm married to a musician, uh, a classical musician, and he plays percussion. Um, and for him, he would go tap, tap. So one, two. So one, two, and then the third one's a little bit more uh, weighty, but just enough to crack it rather than, again, shattering all that uh, to get rid of all that shell. It can go a little bit more, but I just don't want too much because it's going to be hard to locate it. So tap, tap. But you see, even with this, you can see the thickness um, of the shell there. Uh, it just says something about its age. I'm going to pull that just gently away. Um, I very often use the shells here for stop making. You don't so, hit Peter with that, do you? What do you say? You don't hit Peter with that, do you? <laughs> just gently, gently pull that away. I don't know if I'm going to get that last little piece out. No, I've lost my claw in there. So and of just... course, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, fishmongers leave that in, in, intact, but inside you've got that little bit of cartilage. So I'm going to just use um, another scoop just to take this off. Now I've got a little a project where I'm staying at the moment in lockdown. I've got neighbours and there's four guys that live locally and they all want to know how to dress a crab. So we're going to have a crabathon uh, again using a Zoom meeting. Uh, they've all been sent instructions on what they need to have. I'm going to get them the crab. And then they're all going to dress up uh, and they're going to have their crabathon with me. I already live about 50 metres apart, um, but uh, we're going to be doing this uh, on a Zoom. And I'm thinking it's about the, the right length of time. Put a little bit more of that off. Again, you've got that, um, uh, that little bit of sort of cartilage in there, which you really don't want to leave in there. If you bite on that, you'll know about it. DJ? So, yeah. Uh, Sophie's asking, how old's the crab that you're dressing? How old? Yeah. Um, I would say probably again between 12 and 14 years. The crustacea for crab and lobster at the same uh, growth rate, 500 grams to seven to eight years. So they're slow growing. Um, so this is another reason for not, apart from the fact that they all, the big ones are tough. I've seen lobster, certainly not a much bigger crab than this, but um, lobsters that we reckon were 50 or 60 years old at Billingsgate. Uh, and the only people really interested in buying those are actually the Oriental market. I think there's a, a thing about longevity of life uh, and uh, something that's got uh, been around for a while. But it's uh, quite, quite a size. So um, as we did yes, last week when we were talking about the hake, I'd use lots of things for stop making. I'd certainly uh, use the claws for this. There's a little bit more to come out there and make a risotto with it. Um, just to, to, so that's just out of one claw, uh, one side of the claw. I'm going to crack again. I'm not going to be able to do all of this in the time, but just to pull that out. And then what I want to do with this, I'm not going to add anything to this white meat, but what I want to do is shake the bowl. Uh, and by shaking it, I can actually hear whether there's actually any shell in there. And I would say none in there. Uh, Fishmongers Company, uh, the livery company, uh, they do and have a very, very, uh, very excellent chef working there. And I know that uh, if they ever served crab at one of their big dinners for 200, um, the day before, there was one person's job to pick over the crab to make sure there was no shell. And I'm sure he would be standing uh, at the end of the dinner looking at the plates to make sure nothing came back with a bit of shell on it. Um, but uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a thing. And there's 
if you have a crab sandwich, it's actually really horrible biting into it and you can, you know, you can crunch in it, you know, you can cut your tongue or do something. Right, carrying on cracking. I'm going to give up there, actually. <laughs> I think um, I, there's a lot to do. It'll take me another 20 minutes to get the brown meat out, season that, crack these claws. It's certainly um, a big job. Um, so what I'm going to do now is cheat and show you the one that I got earlier. Um, ready to go. There's a few... Uh... There's a few coming up just uh, just now, CJ. That um, um, can you mix uh, both talking about crab meat together? I think personally, it would be a pity. Actually, um, you know, they're such different products. The other thing is, if you went to the market and bought uh, crab meat, picked out a uh, white crab meat out of the shell, you'll be paying four times the amount for white crab meat fresh than you would do for the brown. Uh, brown is, uh, you know, it's it's quite a acquired taste. I know some people love it, um, but the white meat is is where the value is. So, uh, for my, to my mind, it probably would waste it. I keep them separate, and certainly uh, when I'm putting putting the whole thing back in the shell, that's exactly what I would do. Um, any thoughts on that, Roy? No, I, I, I agree with you. I, I prefer just to get the the whole crabs in and then just pick them down. Um, it's interesting, a lot of people talk about ultraviolet light. Um, I've never used that before. Um, Carla says this, they say ultraviolet light shows up the shell. And Arthur says chefs use black light now to spot the shells. Uh, getting a lot of debate on this. And also it's probably about the right time to mention that, you know, there is a competition on Instagram. And, you know, the, the winner will uh, go to Peterhead Market in 2028. So, what to look forward to? I'm only joking about 2028. It's a bit of sense of humour. Yes. Or you <laughs> not too sure. Well, the way we're going at the moment, you just never know. Um, I'm hoping actually that we're going to end up being able to go up on, on this trip as well because I, it's one of the most inspirational visits I've ever been on. I've been a couple of times. Once with Jess Sparks um, from Seafish, and once with Jimmy Buchan. Um, and uh, I just, for anybody that's interested in any food, just seeing these big 50 kilo boxes of products coming into the market ready for sale and bought by agents and moved on is, is absolutely uh, mind blowing actually. So, right, next one to go. I think, just looking at time, what I think I'm gonna do now is uh, having cleaned my shell, I'm gonna get the one that actually I prepared earlier. It's a little bit like Blue Peter now. That really dates me, doesn't it? And then I think what I'm gonna do is just quickly look at the, uh, the discussion of, of shucking an oyster, if that's okay. So have I cheated too much? Uh, you made a right bloody mess. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll, what I'll do is I'll take the meat out and see, yeah. see what we've got. <laughs> Thank you. You could sell tickets to the Peterhead Fish Market to company uh, to accompany the winner. That would be fab. Who was that from? Anne Keelan. We'll think about that, Anne. Well, the other thing is as well that... Um, for the post on Instagram, um, it has to be something that you've created and something that the, the chefs um, post up and uh, the winner is the one that, that's chosen, is the one that goes to uh, Peterhead. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great prize. Just don't know when we're going to get back, do we? And also Beth Carter, um, she's asking, what season would you use for crab meat? What seasoning would you use for crab meat? Oh, for me? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm afraid there's a bit of advertising here. Sarsons vinegar, I particularly like. I remember as, a, as a, a child, my dad used to come home from City of London work on a, a Friday night and he'd buy a crab and he'd, be, he'd roll up his sleeves and he'd gone in and he always put brown vinegar, not too much, but for me, it really cut some of the fat. Um, mustard, I suppose traditionally, you'd use English Coleman's mustard, but actually, uh, whatever you want. Um, and then cayenne pepper, salt and pepper, a little bit of Tabasco if you want it, a little bit of Worcester sauce. The mm. other thing I quite like instead of salt is a little bit of anchovy essence. Uh, I don't know what you use, but those would be things that I would uh, dig out of my fridge. We usually do uh, like uh, English mustard mayonnaise and we use nutmeg as well or some mace. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, just a bit of old classic mace. Just, um, we just um, dust it over the top well with the microplane. Right, very good. A little bit. Okay, so I have one that was prepared earlier. It's a smaller one. But there is the one that was prepared a little bit earlier. Um, and I would use the legs for decoration. 
Now, you're criticising me for making a mess, but I've only got a small area to work in, so... Mate, you should see my kitchen after today when I'm there alone with no kitchen porter, no help. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so a little uh, around the edge, just to, to garnish. Now, my parents, and I don't know whether they joked about this, they said during the Second World War, they remember just after the war seeing dressed crab. And the traditional garnish for this is uh, finely chopped parsley, sift egg yolk, hard boiled egg yolk, and chopped hard boiled egg white. And they said that they saw the Union Jack across the top of this. Now, I tried to recreate it for VE Day, and it's impossible, uh, but I can imagine those, those stripes. <laughs> Might be slightly easier with your flag, but with the, uh, the, um, the Union Jack, a little bit more of a challenge. Right, okay, now I've done a lot of videos for the Shellfish Association of Great Britain, um, and all of these can be picked up on that. It's really worth looking to have how-to videos. Um, and for an oyster, this is my rock oyster, um, which is that long sort of teardrop shape. Uh, interestingly, the size and shape of these will depend very much on the nutrients in the water. So Carlingford Bay, for me, I think they have possibly a lower level of nutrients because they're very, very long, uh, really almost banana shaped sometimes. They've um, got what I'm going to do, yeah, you've got to say. an interesting tidal, haven't they? Because they've got the natural water coming out and then they've got the tidal waves coming in. So they've got nutrients coming from both land and sea. sides. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the flavour for these um, is extraordinary. Um, I prefer this type of um, chucking knife. Um, partly because it's got a short blade. I've got, I've got very, my wrist and knuckles um, are getting a bit ancient. Uh, so I need something that I can actually embed. And uh, for me personally, I like to go in at the heel, um, right at the heel. Some people go in 10 to or 10 past. So either at that side or this side. And there is a thing called a Rossmore um, oyster shucker, where it's like a, uh, it's a little bit like a paper, um, hole punch and you make a hole in the end and then insert uh, the blade that way but I find that it actually the shell of these shatters uh, very easily so I'm going to hold on to that I'm going to take my shucking knife and just pressing it onto the board just to now uh, enable the blade to really embed in that oyster so really embedding and once it's stuck and can't move you take a step back you take a, a breath and then instead of pushing, what you're gonna try and just see what I'm doing here, so I can, you can see, uh, what I'm gonna do is twist, and then you shuck. You, I don't know if you heard it, but by twisting, if you push and twist at the same time, that's when the thing slips and you can cut yourself. So embed, embed twist, and uh, slice. Now that's taken me two minutes from the time I've spoken about it. Um, I judged the um, National uh, Oyster Championships. I think you probably have something similar in Scotland. Um, and they, they worked with uh, native oysters. Uh, the longest time, you, you might be able to know, you might be able to tell me this, what would be uh, the, um, the time to shuck um, 30 oysters? What do you think? Oh, I don't think it should take more than three minutes, four minutes. Uh, actually, I think it was about two minutes 20. Yeah. It was somebody like Sheepies in London that did it. Um, and what they did is they in, uh, they, they have 30 natives, which I think the shells are a little bit more uh, fragile. Uh, they took the, we, we then inspected them. Uh, mm. They'd have to shuck 30, arrange them on a big platter. And then what they would do is they, they need, we double check to make sure there was no shards of shell in there. Um, and then the other thing is that they should really, to be served, they should be released from the shell and flipped over. Um, so you get the best side of the serving uppermost. And we'll be looking at all of those and then deciding um, out of those um, if as long as there was no blood on there, uh, we would, um, what's somebody saying, said their first oyster recently. Uh, and then uh, we would mark them down and a bit of shard of shell, a damaged oyster would take off marks. But it worked out to be about two minutes, 30 seconds wow. for 30. So uh, that's speedy work. But if you're working and just doing an oyster bar, you'd expect that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to just Let's lose my I've got a little thing on the screen. So uh, just some ideas today, um, just enjoying all that fabulous uh, Scottish shellfish. Um, Roy, really good to see you again. Um, and next week then we've got flatfish. So um, we would be, uh, we're going to be looking at place, lemon sole, witch, talking about megrim. 
uh, anything that we can get out of Scotland. Um, and uh, so that's going to be our plan for next, next Wednesday. Well, CJ, thanks very much. As always, it's a pleasure to watch your work. And, you know, it, it's, um, it's really, you've got this sort of natural approach. Like Rick Stein, you know, you just, you deliver really well and you make it just look absolutely yummy. So, uh, well done. No, well, thank you. And you've got the easy job, but it's very, it's great to get your thoughts on how you might cook it. I can't wait to come up for dinner. I think I might have to drive up this afternoon. Get my <laughs> takeaway. Anytime. Up you okay, come. Okay, really nice. Um, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, great to see you. And please come back next week.